Revolutionary talk for revolutionary times. Promoting peace, liberty, and prosperity around the clock. LibertyTalk.fm. Welcome to Living in the Solution with Dr. Elena George. Today we have a return guest, someone who I'm looking forward to speaking with. We're going to speak with Mr. James Gorey. He's got a wealth of information and he's, a, I think, a Renaissance man. He's an author. He's been a filmmaker. He writes for the Epic Times and speaks on a variety of topics such as the financial tech um, industry, cybersecurity. And he has a website called The Banana Republican, where he covers a wide range of topics, including current events, China, the economy, and everything pertaining to it, and other things that enrich our lives, such as science, technology, religion, and culture. And today we're going to have a conversation about the American dream. You know, when I was a kid, it was always about the white picket fence. It was about being independent, putting away savings, and so that your children could live better than you did. I think that was the underlying foundation of the American dream. And you wrote an article for the Epic Times entitled How Wall Street is Killing the American Dream. And I wanted to discuss that because as we spoke about before we started the show, I think people, whether they're homeowners, whether they're renting, they know something's wrong, but I'm not sure they can get their brain around what's happening. So I wanted to thank you so much for coming back on today. Absolutely, Dr. George. My pleasure, and I, I think you are right. There is a, a a sense that the American dream and, and the whole idea and the foundation of the Amer of the America that you and I grew up with um, is somehow not uh, reachable, out of reach. Maybe it was never even there, or if it was there, it was not legitimate. I will say that. So, yeah, I, I felt this article was a very important, very important to get out there because of you and I both know that the American dream is is not what it was, but it certainly can be again. Well, I think that's very hopeful. So my first question is, what made you come up with this article? It's very unique and it's very specific. Is there something about the economy, about what's going on in our society that triggered this for you? Absolutely. I've been looking, I've looked at real estate for uh, at least a, a, you know 10 or 15 years. I've owned several properties in, in, in the past, and I'm about to own and uh, pick up another one. But the, the, the thing I'm, I was looking at was how a lot of these properties on the single family, uh, you know, the single family ownership skyrocketed in 2005 and six and seven, and then it, it went the other direction due to the fact of the, the great financial crisis and, and those types of things. In the aftermath of that, we saw a, some some homes being sold, you know, by by tranches, not one or twos, but by dozens or so and being picked up. That was to be expected, I suppose, because so many were just vacant and whole neighborhoods were vacant at the time. But now it's become a, it hasn't gone away. And I'm noticing much more cash buying and much more um, rents are, are just skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. So there has to be something up. And it's, it's Wall Street institutional buyers that are, are, are picking up houses, especially in the last six, seven, eight years. When I think about what you said, it, it reminds me of the healthcare industry, specifically the independent practices. That same Wall Street, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, this movement is happening in the healthcare sector where private practices were being bought out and managed by Wall Street firms. I think it happened to the veterinarian section you know, all these other independent wealth creating entities, including being a homeowner. Isn't that one of the most important ways and easiest ways that people found to create wealth in our society? It is. And it's a way to, to create transgenerational wealth. You, know, you inherit your, your homes, your home from your parents and grandparents. And so it was a, it's a great way for to transfer wealth from one generation to the next. And to, to hit on your prior point, there is a tremendous elevation or transference is a better is a better word of wealth from the middle class going up to the to the um, to the upper class to the Wall Street class, and that's by design. And there's a very simple way of of, of seeing how that happens. You know, banks, the big banks, co are coordinated with the with the Fed, and 
then the banks below them are coordinated with them as well. And, you know, they get infusions of cash. They get you know, large infusions of cash to supposedly go into the economy at very low interest rates. And they have to go somewhere. Sometimes it's the stock market. Sometimes it's, it's the, the, the healthcare industry. In other words, anytime you have large amounts of capital flowing from the Federal Reserve or the government into, into large businesses, corporations, banks, and so forth, there's a, there's a, just an, in, a, com, a complete imbalance, imbalance of, of power and, and buying capability and market distortions. And it doesn't really matter where it comes from. You know, back in the 80s, uh, Japanese buyers were distorting the market uh, in California. And then when their economy tanked, it, it, it rebounded. It, you know, it had repercussions and it crashed. But with, with federal governments not having to make a profit, as it were, but able to certainly direct policy and to get things done on their agenda, that's what's happening. You're seeing a, a, a transfer of wealth generating assets asset classes and and industries moving being taken out of the middle class up to the one uh, percent and that's by cheap money lots of it and very little legal uh protections in place to, to protect the middle class so if i'm reading what you said correctly i remember when i was a kid in new york it was japan and i think then it was the middle eastern money flowing in. I think China came in and basically that's the last huge foreign investment class. Now this is different, you're saying, right? Because it's not about the market anymore. It's about the government partnering with corporate America, or Wall Street, and picking winners and losers. That's that's an ongoing thing. No one's going to want to jump out of that because the money is free flowing and it never stops if you print it up, right? Exactly. There's trillions and trillions of dollars in debt that somehow um, get rolled over. In the meantime, more money's flowing to these large banks, these large corporate interests. And yeah, they're buying up land. They're buying up businesses. They're buying up mortgages. They're buying up. So the, so the government's becoming a, and, and the Federal Reserve and the banking system is becoming kind of a, an owner of, rather an owner of last resort. Now it's an owner of first resort. In other words, I, I think in my article, I, I talk about a, a MetLife prediction or projection that corporate ownership of houses, single family residents will be at 40% by 2030, where it was basically zero 20 years ago or close enough. So why would that be happening? Well, it's, it's, as you point out, it's happening in other sectors and uh, industries. So why wouldn't it happen in real estate? And um, the problem is, is when these, when these institutional buyers, they may buy entire divisions from, from the home builders and then set the rent, set the prices. So they buy it before they're built or at, just as they're built. They buy the, a lot of them, all of them, most of them, however, whatever they can. And now if you own it, you own the, you set the, you set the purchase price, you set the rental price. So it's no longer a market. It's a, it's a monopoly if you will, of certain areas and certain types of housing. Certainly there are corporate apartment buildings and apartment companies, of course, as well. They tend to set market rates, but if they're all, you know, if they're all working at the same level, then there's a bit of, a bit of price setting that goes on, if mm -hmm. you will, because it's not market driven, it's, it's owner driven. Again, I, I'm seeing a correlation like with this and the healthcare space with the big pharma and the, the pharmacies joining together, you know, in these silos where you have preferred pharmacies and they get to set the price, they get to set what the formulary is. And that usually means, and I'm going to extrapolate from the healthcare to everything else. That means less choice for the, the individual. That means more money that you're going to have to put out and you're going to lose power. Like you lose control over your your individual pocketbook. You mean there's only game if you're the only game in town, right? You're forced to enter that system whether you like it or not. And I that really troubles me. But yes, particularly if they eliminate the competition and not just in kind but in the marketplace. So for example, uh we'll look at this r ridiculous and, and and utterly overreach of the pharmaceutical industry with regard to the to the vaccines for the COVID 
I don't know where you stand on, on that one way or the other, but it, it's, it ought, certainly ought to bother everybody that a handful of companies, literally a handful of companies are not only chosen to provide this vaccine, but are given protection from any kind of blowback in terms of, uh, of uh, harmful and, uh, results from that and outcomes and so forth, and became mandated for a lot of government agencies and, and educational you know, institutions, schools, high schools, colleges, and so forth, and workplaces. So it, and it mandated those things. But on the flip side, it took away the alternative. They, they outlawed or invalidated, delegitimized other alternatives that may have been successful or were successful. So there's way too much power. We're seeing a lot of power and money and control and lack of choice and alternatives being all being put together at, at the government and corporate level. And that's called fascism. Exactly. You, you took the word out of my mouth. It's this cycle of money changing hands between two groups that benefit each other. So if you know that if people look at the money going into the lobbyists, one of the top 10 is healthcare space. I don't know where real estate fits in that, or I should say Wall Street, but I'm sure it's pretty high. So if they're giving money to various campaigns, they're going to get the legislation that they want. They're not going to get pushback. And whoever, you know, they're supposed to be working for the people, everybody in, in governmental position, whether that's local or federal. But it seems to me that we're the outlier. They could care less about working for the interest of their constituents at this point, it's all, it's like a whole section. It's all about getting in and getting in again and again and follow the money. Yeah, it becomes a closed circle. And, it, you know, that, that also uh, attaches to pharmaceutical executives and the FDA. Um, so you have executives being, uh, being uh, or FDA executives in offices, officials, then take jobs in the pharmaceutical industries, come in the firms that, that they were you know, regulating or approving, as it were, uh, pharmaceutical remedies and, and, and formulas and, and vaccines. And now, after five years there, they step into a, you know, a multi-million dollar executive role with, with Pfizer or with Moderna or whomever. And so there's, there's that cloistered kind of <laughs> inbreeding of, of, of officers and officials and executives so there's no honesty, there's no openness, there's no competitiveness. It's a closed group, and, and neither you nor I are in it, by the way. No. Um, well, what makes it interesting? You know, we're, buying, we're buying units, right? <laughs> Basically, we we're just, yeah, you're right. But what makes it interesting, too, is that they want to call this democracy, and they want to poo-poo capitalism. But this is not capitalism, which you just described, where you can hang up your shingle, you can put open up your store, and you can free freely compete with your neighbor or the person down the block that's not happening anymore so that i don't believe you can call this capitalism can you no not in the sense that it's supposed to be because remember capitalism is supposed to be is supposed to be coupled with liberty and freedom and choice the whole idea of capitalism is to provide market choice um, at least as it was envisioned uh in the u.s so from a from a you know, choice and competition and reward is it are, are all great things for a, a society. It, it it breeds excellence. It, it incentivizes people to do things differently. The problem is, is when you have too much power in, in too few hands, and that power is is married and joined at the hip, if you will, between corporatism, financialism, and uh, government. Th then that's that iron triangle that. Other com countries have, like Ch uh, Japan, and has had it for, for decades, and China as well, where you there is no there is no top to bottom down filter or transition of capital. There is our decisions made at the top, and then they're handed down. And when that happens, we don't have a democracy. We don't want to live in a democracy. We live in a republic. Mm -hmm. But uh, when our republic, rep when our representatives are are subject to to, to bribery or to high influence and to rewards once they leave uh, their government post, then they're apt to behave in ways that will get them that government, that uh, executive post once they leave their government role. So, yeah, the, it's, the system isn't, isn't operating the way it was designed to operate. 
And, you know, that isn't new. I mean, Eisenhower, Eisenhower in his farewell address back in 1961, I believe, warned about the military-industrial complex, describing the same type of thing. On that note, let's take our first break and just digest that, because what you've just said is a mouthful and it's truth. And people need to understand that the, I mean, there is no level playing field. There's are two tiers and some people can play the game and others can't. So let's take our first break. You're living in the solution. Welcome back to Living in Solution. We're speaking with Mr. James Gorey, and he's the author of The China Crisis. He's also writes for Zero Hedge or has written for Zero Hedge and Real Real Clear Politics. And before the break, you did a wonderful job of giving a foundation for this system. You know, I've said it many times on on the podcast that this is not a game that we can play and hope to win at. So the only way to win is not to play the game at all, because you just described a whole infrastructure. Who has enough money to play this game except these people that we just described? So from the standpoint of this this template that's been using that, that's been used, do you think that the housing market is one of the last pieces of this this machine that's coming online? We've done healthcare, we've done politics. We've done education, I think. That's pretty much gone. <laughs> and so now we're dealing with what, you know, our, the real essence, our home, the thing that makes us a family, gives us a foundation. They're trying to steal that from people. Is this one, another piece of this game, this board? I mean, a piece on this on this game that they're playing? It sure looks like it. Uh, and I think on the upside, or at least there was, there was reason for for optimism and that people are aware of it. And there are some legislation that's coming out in Texas and different places. Nothing's been been passed yet. I, I think in, in, in a large measure, and there's some irony here, it takes a billionaire real estate developer to, to catch, uh, you know, to, to fight this kind of thing. I think that's where Donald Trump kind of brings in, you know, inside baseball knowledge about how how Wall Street works, how how the real estate industry works, and and um, and by the way, we're we're seeing the corporate real estate um, having some very big problems with the three-year notes that are now maturing that were last issued when the interest rates were at two percent, and now they're at seven, eight percent, um, and so a lot of those corporate offices, office buildings that Wall Street has obviously been you know landlords and investors in and so forth. Those are those are problematic. Now there may be there may be some some remedies such as extending the the, the term of the existing notes and so forth. But by and large, and I'm not the only one to say this, you know, folks like Elon Musk and, and other Wall Street people said too, is that they're looking at a at a at a collapse or, a, or at least a an adjustment, and I mean that in in the in the stark terms of evaluations. We're already seeing that and. I don't think there can be enough loans extended to to prevent that. People just aren't going to the office buildings in downtown areas, in, in the urban areas, the way they were pre-COVID. And the way that our urban centers are being uh, disturbed and um, destroyed by you know, unsafe conditions and homelessness and rioting and those kinds of things, I don't think the values are going to return across the board quick enough, soon enough, or high enough to save corporate real estate. And so my point there is that commercial real estate is, is often a precursor or a trigger to set, to set the, the real estate, the uh, residential real estate market to follow suit. They, we may see a, a real adjustment downward there as well. But uh, it is the last bastion of, of homeownership is the last bastion. If you have a nation of renters, you can control them. If you have a nation of homeowners, it's much harder to control. Because they have their home, and they have assets, they have equity, and they have, I mean, they can have, you know, if, if they need to earn living, they can rent rooms out and so forth, which we're seeing that a lot of and so forth. So you're right. The home, attacking the home is kind of one of the biggest and last straws that they want to uh, to lay on the camel's back here. So from the standpoint of the individual, I mean, it's it's hard to say this, but I mean, are we in a position where we're, we can be overwhelmed by this tidal wave because of debt, because people 
I mean, COVID was a major, major player in this, wasn't it? Where you had people who were stable, who owned their own, whether they hung out their shingle and had their own business, which went under during COVID, where we had the, those were too big to fail, you know, or, you know, an essential, and those were deemed mm -hmm. unessential. Did that trigger this? Was that the first log that was pulled away that allowed people to be a little bit more resilient? Did they lose their resilience because they lost their ability to make money, to own their own business, for example? Certainly some people did, although I don't think we're going to see that kind of reaction uh, again, whether or not we have another quote unquote pandemic or other types of medical emergency. People won't comply to a large extent. And the other thing it's done is it has, it has um, served as kind of a, a, a fire, putting a fire in the belly of people to, to readjust. People are flexible. People are resilient. And online businesses and um, people buying houses with two or three people on, on, on the deed as opposed to one or two, maybe three or four. Um, there's a lot of ways to combat this. Um, Veteran and VA loans, veteran administration loans are assumable, and those that were issued uh, during the lower rates, they are assumable by by uh, new buyers. So, you know, when people move that with with a VA loan, they can their buyers can assume it. So it's it's a nice way of getting into a house with with nothing down on assumable loan. But presumably, you have the credit to do so. So there's a lot of options that people can do that it takes a little bit of effort, a little bit of creativity, but people are uh, have tremendous amounts of effort and creativity. So I, I think the, the, the writings on the wall that Wall Street and the banks would certainly love to own the property market and uh, you know push everyone into the rental, into the rental column. Mm -hmm. And that, that's happening to some degree, but I also think this, there'll be some pushback. Now, you know, COVID was, I think, a big test. Of, I think they sound so, I don't know what's the word, conspiratorial, but it was certainly a test of, of our rights as individuals, our rights as Americans. I mean, we weren't, all of a sudden the CDDC says, if you're a landlord, you can no longer collect rent uh, yeah. from your tenants. Well, I don't remember electing the CDC. In fact, I don't think it's even a member of the, of the uh, that's not a government agency, as I recall. It's a private agency. But so we saw a lot of abuse um, under the cover, under the under the guise of of safety, but keeping people safe means stay in your house, shut up, wear a mask, and and and, and don't have an opinion. And that's wearing thin on the American public, I think. I hope to, so. To a certain extent, I certainly yeah. hope so. And it reminds me too of the the student loan aspect of this. Right, people didn't have to pay just like they didn't have to pay their rent, didn't have to pay their student loan debt. And now there's this tsunami of now that it's activated again how much you owe or how much more in debt are you? It just had so many long-term effects for such a short and small, I don't think there was a gain, honestly, but for what they, what the proposed gain was, it certainly didn't weigh, outweigh what people are dealing with now. No, it didn't. And it, 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 what it did serve, it did serve a purpose, whether they intended it or not, is it let us, it kind of let the American people see who, you know, who, who is behind the American idea and who would like to see all the rules changed. And, you know, that, that woke crowd, the, the whole idea of, of not paying things back and, and getting these enormously expensive university degrees with, with no tangible <laughs> application in real life. <laughs> you know, that has soured a lot of people on college. And rightly so. I, I know of plumbers making a hundred thousand a year. Uh, I know of teachers making forty-five thousand a year. Right? Yeah. I mean, so you yeah. can, you think about it in terms of uh, entrepreneurs, right? You, mm -hmm. you, people now are getting together and saying, "Look, let's start a business." We, we all got part-time jobs because we're underemployed. But so it, it I, again, it has it cuts both ways. It can depress people. Oh, I got this degree and I have all this debt and I wasted my time and my money and my, my youth, et cetera. There's that part. But the other part is people aren't seeing the value of going to college anymore. And I don't think everyone needs to have a college degree. I know uh, Bill Gates doesn't have a college degree and um, I think he did okay. Steven Spielberg doesn't have a college degree. He already got one a few years back, but 
I, I think the point is, is that if you're talented and you're, and you work hard and you work smart and you get out there, you can make things happen. And, um, it doesn't have to be on the Spielberg or the, or the Bill Gates level. It can be on the installation of windows level, or mm-hmm. it can be on the, you know, things that, the, the, the baseline economy needs to have done. People need to have done the service industries. It's steady work. Absolutely is. Or if you know how to fix appliances or things, you know, skill level that people never learned, you're going to be very valuable with supply chain issues exactly. and everything else. Supply chain issues, house cleaning. I, I've got a, a, a couple who started a maid service for house cleaning and now they're multi-millionaire. They own a couple of multi-million dollar properties. And, you know, so I know them just from a, a tangential acquaintance. I'm not great friends with them, but I, I did speak to them one couple of times. They said, look, yeah, we, we start small and then we delivered a great service at a great price. Wow. What a concept. And that's where it starts. What a concept, right? Dr. Yeah, George, yeah. deliver quality at, at, at a repeatable price. You're going to get, a, you're going to have a lot of people knocking on your door. I think it's it, maybe it's going to force people, jog them out of this complacency of there's one path, and they they've created this, I don't know, um, propaganda maybe about one path. You need to go through high school, you need to go to college, you need to take on massive amounts of debt, you need to have advanced degrees in order to be successful. When in actuality, that's actually put you on the path that we're seeing people get it damaged by because they have all this stuff. But they're, well, you know, yeah. they're, they're trying to create a declaration of dependence, as yep. it were, a generational dependence, right? You're not smart enough to get into school, so we're going to lower the standards. Or you, 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 you need to get a college degree, and if you don't get a college degree, or you do and you don't get a job, then it's due to some other external force beyond mm-hmm. your control. There are, so this goes into all kinds of relationships uh, between people. But I have found in life, and I'm sure, you, I'm sure you have too, is that if somebody does a really good job, and you need that skill or you need that service, you're going to hire them. Exactly. doesn't matter what they look like. <laughs> it, doesn't matter. it doesn't matter what no. they look like. You're going to hire them. Exactly. If you're good at sales, you're good at sales. And if, you, if you're good at setting bones, you're going to be a great orthopedic surgeon, whatever it might be, right? I mean, that's yeah. just and, – and if you're not, then you ought not to be in that field. It's very and, simple. Uh, what's that? It's a very simple concept, isn't it? I know, I know, and that's what our founding fathers figured out really, really quickly. They figured out, look, because you know, when they first came here, they, it, it was communism. It was everybody works their ability and contributes. Well, they starve. <laughs> <laughs> people, people forget about that. But Jamestown was originally a commune, and people who you know, he, he had to come out and say uh, the leader, the, I can't remember his name, but he said, "Look, you don't work, you don't eat." And uh, by the time a hundred years later. Uh, a bustling economy. People were, you know, you could start a business anywhere. You could, you know, whatever, whatever it was, and you had you had opportunity because there was more people, more demand. As far as I can tell, the the population in the U.S. is still rising. It's moving around a little bit. It's going it's going where the demand is, right? It's going where the market is free. It's going where there's opportunity. And I, I thankfully, they haven't proposed any kind of laws that prevent people from moving through the country freely to where those opportunities are. But that's what's going to happen. You're going to see two different states of America. We are probably have it a little bit here, obviously. But I think when it comes to real estate, you're going to go to housing, go go buy where you can buy, buy a house. You're going to leave California and you're going to go somewhere else to buy a house and get a job and earn a living and provide for your family. And that's what and, should uh, happen. Yeah. Actually, I want to backtrack to what you said about people who have the VA loans. Am I reading it correctly that you don't, if they sell the property, I don't know, you can't, if you're not a, a veteran, you can't access a VA loan, can you? I think you can. Yes, wow. you can assume, a VA loans are assumable. Well, that's Last pretty amazing. I read, if, they, if they've changed the law recently, that may be the case. But as far as I know, as far as I know they are assumable. Oh, uh, that's pretty incre- incredible because their their rates are completely. It's a different scale than the commercial side of this. And they're hundred percent loan to value too, right? So oh, wow. veterans can get in with no money down, and and someone else can assume the loan. That's impressive. So it's a yeah. yeah I, I used to be in real estate as a mortgage broker years and years ago, and uh, 
that was one of our one of the selling points, a couple of selling points. You get in, you get you know easier to qualify. Obviously, no money down, and people can assume them. I think that's still the case. Wow, just imagine um, that. I mean, you feel like you're right. You're priced out at this point because the the money down, the interest rates are. But well, I don't even know what they are now. Eight, maybe nine percent. Who knows? But it's priced out. Young people with first houses, the seniors are getting pretty much nailed as well. So it's just a it's a free for all. Yeah, people aren't selling because if you you know if you have a a house mortgage that's six hundred thousand at two percent, then your monthly nut is probably somewhere around three grand, I suppose. But if you want to sell that house and pick up another property and put four hundred thousand down, have a six hundred thousand dollar note, well then you that's your hmm. your monthly nut's going to be six seven thousand a month, eight thousand yeah. a month. So. Huh. Whatever it might be, yeah, I've been doing the math quick and dirty in my head, but I think interest rates are between, you know, around seven ish, and um, depending on on the term and the adjustments and then fixed and so forth, different different factors there. But you know, I look at what what remember all the boat people, the Vietnamese folks and yeah. the Cambodians came over in the in the eighties. Yeah, the Hmong. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the, yeah. Well, in in Westminster, California, a lot of them in Garden Grove, they just as soon as they could, they, they banded their money together and bought a house. They, they lived together in an apartment, you know, five, ten of them, whatever it was. And then they bought it. They bought a house, and they all lived in the house. And then, when they could, they bought another house. And they they literally coordinated. You know, they pooled their efforts. Of you had five, eight working adults, and uh, that's what they did because they could see that once you, you know, once you're on the ladder. It's it's like the biblical thing. To those who have more, will be given. To those who don't. Even what they have will be taken. What that means, I think, is is you do one smart decision, and then you're in your position to take another smart step, and then another smart step. But when you take, you know, when you make poor decisions, even what you have, you'll lose. So there are there's always opportunity. It's, it's being able to see it, and I think in in the case of just to bring it full circle to the to the corporate ownership of of houses, I think they'd like to have a nation of renters. Yeah. Uh, because it takes away that kind of power, it takes it it, it 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 breeds dependency, despair, and when you're dependent and despairing, you're easily controlled. I absolutely agree with you. That that fear and anxiety is paralyzing, and it makes you, or it makes you more liable or more easily uh, of the mindset that someone has to take care of me, and that's exactly what I think the system. Is designed to have happen. I mean, it just reminds me of the world, the WEF, and you'll own nothing and like it. I mean, is this is pretty much what they've decided how they want the system to run, and is this an example of it? Yeah, and interesting, you brought that up. You know what's fascinating about that, and I don't want to be uh, under underplay. It's it's uh, the horror <laughs> of the prospect of that. But what I find fascinating is that. Somehow, this guy Klaus and his his entourage of of monstrous human beings they feel comfortable announcing it as if it's a done deal, and that is something that is I haven't heard anybody say really. Oh gosh, my question is how do they? Where does that confidence come from? They're either going to look like idiots to the whole world, or 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 they know something we don't. <laughs> I hate to put it in those two terms, but you, you catch my drift, right? I do. You, you I do. Say, obviously, why would you go public and say, I'm going to do this, or you're going to own nothing and you'll love it? And then I, I watched some videos of these guys talking, and, and there's our President Joe Biden in the audience. So maybe he's not talking through his hat. Who knows? I think we, what we're saying underneath everything is that we as individuals have the power. We can choose. We have a choice here. You can choose to opt out of this system of despair, find alternative pathways, which you've just admirably, admirably described. And that's not the only place that we can do it. You know, you make your decisions, and you're right. You make good decisions after good decisions that keep you out of this debt trap and in the clutches of the system, where once you're in, they don't want you out, and they want your mind to be overtaken by. Why well, I'm just one person? What can I do? Then they've won when you start to think like that. And I know you know we we haven't talked about 
the uh, you know the divide and conquer strategy of everybody being a victim and everybody is out to get everybody else that's another example of this to me where you you have people hating on each other so much they cannot see the bigger picture because they're too busy in the mud <laughs> is that something that you think also with this DEI and all these other corporate games that they play that they're trying to really just parse people and actually make us our lowest common denominator. Sure. There it's with the DEI, uh, what is it? Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, but yeah. it's also with ESG, um, environmental, social, and governance. Uh, and they, I, I wrote a piece on this a while back as well. Oh, how ESG is chain, you know, stakeholder capitalism versus just stockholder capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a play on words. And, if you're a public company, your uh, fiduciary obligation is to your stockholders. But if you're a public company, according to the ESG uh, doctrine, then the stakeholders are the rest of the world because they have a stake in how you run your company, who can buy what you produce, who's on your board, because what you do affects everybody else. And so now you're you know, so stakeholder capitalism is another word for fascism. It's just it's just they, you know they take a a word like capitalism and they attach another modifier to it, and um, you, you think it sounds pretty close, but it's completely different. It's they never call things as they are. No, it's a manipulation. I mean, they, I mean yeah, it, yeah, it's, a, it's the abuse of language, right? Exactly. And it sounds yeah. all great, so, but it's the opposite of what what it really said. What they're saying and what it means are two different things. Exactly. Now, diversity and equity and inclusion well, and, and the wokeness that comes with it. Now, it wasn't me who pointed it out, but um, I, I'm sure we've all felt it. You know, when I said to my wife, we were watching a, a show and a 115 pound girl takes, you know, actress, woman, hits a guy in the jaw, a 220 pound guy in the jaw and knocks him down. And, and, you know, the story loses all credibility when that happens. <laughs> it's sure it, it's supposed to empower women, but it's also, <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, telling someone a lie does not empower them, right? It, no. it, it's, it, you're lying to them. And these woke Marvel characters, this, this last movie that Disney's been a disaster is, is kind of proof of that. Other all these, the, the the movie industry is ESG and, and DEI and woke and, and every other acronym that that stands for that seeks to delegitimize traditional norms and values that that which the country was founded on, by the way. I mean, it's you know, it, it's it's America is one of the few countries that's founded on a set of ideals put in put on a document. You know, what's um, interesting is that people aren't buying it, right? They're not going to these movies. They're not buying the products. They're not going to these stores. So it's it's not like it's that they hope that it's pervading society, but society is rejecting it. But then when you think about where the money comes from, they can afford to do this to the cows come home because they don't depend on us buying their product. They just want to basically mind control us or manipulate reality to gain what they want to gain. That's true. They're not depending on the American market. Hollywood's run by China. It's funded by China. Um, either through Chinese investment in in the in the in the actual production, and or in the China market where the, the movies are shown, and so because China has such influence over the the film market, the film industry, especially in Hollywood per se, Hollywood is subject to China censors, mm -hmm. and that's been going on an awful long time. Think back to the movie 2012, Who Saves the World with these the arcs? It's China. Mm -hmm saved the world with the arcs, right? In 2012, China couldn't build a dam, that could barely build a dam that wouldn't burst after five years. So the, the fact is, is that China, you know, was, was that movie was specifically created uh, to do well in China and China became the hero. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the Americans looked awfully bad, actually. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it gets back to the, to the Soviet era of, and the and the the Nazi era propaganda culture because look people know that culture drives politics politics is downstream from culture and um, people get their ideas 
kids particularly young adults get their right get their ideas and their identities from stories from the movies from uh video from anime from whatever whatever form it might take that's where their kind of collective or and even individual values are are truly found most in many times not all the time but a lot of times especially if they don't have anything competing with it so when you think about this now i'm now saying it's starting to become clear about the younger generation they're like they're disconnected honestly from reality from anything that's pro america pro country so if we've been propagandized by these movies and video games etc it's not a big jump to understand why they are so anti what 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 should be capitalism american values family values etc it's really designed to take them out of that paradigm isn't it it absolutely is and what's more family oriented than 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 your own house exactly right yeah what's more you know my dad used to tell my my lost my folks a few years back but um they grew up during the depression and my dad you know we're past the end of california and, and they weren't rich by any stretch of the imagination however they did have you know the depression a lot of folks didn't do well you know a lot of families didn't do well fathers split wives divorced you know, you know things like that and my dad said to me he had a bunch of friends of of every race you can think of and a couple you probably can't these were guys who were digging ditches at 14 and you know hauling ice before the refrigerators and during the you know, just doing really tough jobs going to high school playing on football teams and doing all these rough things and a lot of these guys didn't have intact homes my dad said yeah it's, it's, tom over there had to disarm his dad from attacking with an axe at 14 you know Joe over there, his dad never came back from, you know, a, a sales trip or whatever. You know. So a lot of these kids, my dad grew up with, they ended up in my parents, my grandparents' house. And they would tell me 40 years after the fact, yeah, your, your, your grandparents kept me, kept a roof over my head when I needed and kept my stomach full. And that, that would not be possible if you didn't have a house, you know? Yeah. And so they, yeah, you want the strengths of America, the strength of a society is in, is in the common person's ability. I mean, common, I mean, average person. Yeah, I can get a house. I can get a house. I can put a roof over my head. There's dignity in the work I do. And I, I get paid an honest day's work. And, you know, I sound like a, a Clarence, you know, I sound like a, a socialist, but I'm, I'm not. But I'm, I understand that there's value in property. There's value in pride in ownership and in taking care of your family and having a family and, and being able to do that, those things. So destroying that family unit, destroying your ability to, to afford a house and uh, destroying your ability to earn a living. Well, then you're all, you're dependent on someone else. You're dependent on the government. And you're depending on the kindness of the government that they actually want to see you <laughs> succeed and that these corporate chills that they, they want you to be successful by their product. You know, let's take our last break because I'm curious to know what, I know they stand to gain power, but what's the point if you don't have people to buy your product to actually be consumers? So on that note, let's take our last break. You're living in the solution. Welcome back to Living in Solution. We're speaking with Mr. James Gorey, and you can go to his website, The Banana Republican. It's thebananarepublican.com, the correct? Correct. And they can buy your books, The China Crisis. Is it on that site or... Can they find it on Amazon? It's on Amazon. It, it may be out of print. I need to. Re I need to write another book. But. Okay. <laughs> You're living your life, so I understand. But uh, you know, there's a lot going on, so you could be writing for a while. Um, you know, from yeah. the point of my the last segment is, I understand power. I understand that people want at, at all costs to have it, but. You're a corporate industry. You have to have people buy your product. What's the point of this? If the people are just subsisting, they can't afford to buy anything. And if they want to bring in social credit score, et cetera, I mean, what's the point? What What do you gain from this when there's nothing past subjugation to keep you going? That's a great question. Um, why would you? Yeah, well, it, it's. 
take it, approach it from a, the opposite direction, I suppose. If you look at policies that, such as nine month abortions or first 30 days after birth abortions or um, gender reassignment surgery, where you essentially sterilize young boys and girls. Um, and you look, you listen to the rhetoric of uh, the, the climate folks like John Kerry and the, the wonderful people at the World Economic Forum and King Charles, um, among others. Apparently, population is a big problem. So, it on the one hand, your question is is completely valid. Why would you eliminate the market to keep you in fl- in, 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 in in business for for crying out loud? But on the other hand, it, it seems that population is a big problem to them. Um, so uh, which question is the more on target? Why? What's the big problem with population? China has had that one, one child policy for decades and they're on the verge of collapse in terms of being able to, to support themselves. Yeah. So I, I don't know where the, um, what the end game is, you can certainly pencil it out in a couple of different directions. Um, depopulation of the planet to some degree or to a large degree. I don't know. Uh, I, I've heard different, different wish lists on that from some different people. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it may be they're trying to bring about the end of capitalism. If the end of capitalism, then, you know, as we're seeing now, the corporate, uh, a lot of the Wall Street, they're, they're living off government-issued money to a large extent or to some extent. And, and um, so to be honest with you, I don't understand myself why they would want to eliminate so many potential kind of customers, I guess, mm-hmm. for lack of a better word, in terms of being able to afford things. Um, power being what it is, I suppose, if you go back to the Soviet Union, they had no middle class, really. And uh, for 70 years, the guys in power, the folks in power, had a lot of great lives, for the most part. And in China, is a social credit system, and their middle class is shrinking, and more power is flowing up to the, uh, to the party rapidly. So that seems to be the trend. It didn't earn, end, end well for the Soviet Union. It won't end well for China. It, it, it may not end well for us if we don't change our our trajectory. But uh, as to why, well, I think power likes to be exclusive and so forth. And I, maybe it's just that they don't give a damn about anybody else. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not about money as much as about uh, living well at the expense of the rest. And that's the top one tenth of 1% or whatever it is, right? I think you have 90 million party members in China out of a country of 1.3 or 4 billion people. So, um, Nobody really cares about that. <laughs> about, about the bottom 99.99%, I'm afraid. Well, not until they get excited about taking their power back, then I think they'll care at that point. Um, you know, from from the standpoint yeah. of, I mean, this, you're talking about serfdom, right? Neo-serfdom or going back to that system where it's the serfs and the, you know, everybody else above them. Global feudalism. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and there's a flip side to that, or or another, I say another dimension, and that is, you know, the rise of, of AI has been talked about by none other than Yuval Harari. Um, I guess he's the number two guy up at the at the World Economic Forum. Um, you can construe that as you will. Um, he he talked about, well, what are we going to do with these, you know, billions of useless human beings we don't need? because AI has taken over their jobs. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he said that within the last year or two, um, I don't think it went down well, so he hasn't hasn't brought (laughs) it up lately that I can tell. But um, I think the cat's out of the bag. Certainly, um, as a writer, AI can write as a, you know, that takes away lawyers, that takes away writers, that takes away... um, designers that takes, you know, AI is capable of doing a lot of things, especially, you know, the, the curve is 
once the curve gets steep enough, it, it really goes. And um, I'm not an AI expert, but I have talked to several people in, who know about it. Um, and um, so we may see a lot of people, you know, factory workers and manufacturing and um, <clears throat> a lot of type of um, kind of the intellectual side of things, lawyers, doctors, operations, and so forth, that may be just rendered to an algorithm at some point. I mean, was that part of what the Hollywood strike was about? They didn't want to re be replaced by AI, the writers, the actors, kind of interesting. Uh, since they proponents of this system, they could be the biggest um, victims of it and just put out, you know, non, you know, non sequitur at this point. I mean, AI is sounds good in theory, but it's uncontrollable. I mean, it's, it's something that is self perpetuating and at some point, it may find that humans are unnecessary, no matter if you're in the well, high one percent or not. Right, that was Elon Musk's point. I mean, which is he's a paradox because, on the one hand, he's he and, he and others. He's not the only one. It's more and look, the you know we're releasing the demon with AI because we won't be able to control it. And um, on the other hand, his response to that is to have a company called Neuralink, which will link you up to the internet, <laughs> you know, and we, which will dehumanize you, in other words, right? <laughs> Trying to make you compete with, with AI by becoming an AI, which to me is not a real, that's not a viable option for me, okay? <laughs> Understood completely. <laughs> <laughs> um, looking for volunteers, I understand. So if you have nothing going on, you might want to check them out. But uh, for me, I, I would rather pick weeds, I think, in, uh, in, in the backwaters of, of, uh, of some southern state than I think have some injectable uh, neurological link to the Internet. I just, I just don't think that's a good <laughs> idea. Uh, uh, I'm right along with you on that one. Uh, <laughs> I just don't see that. I don't see that as helping humanity or, or even uh, preserving my humanity. I don't want to keep up with AI, right? No. So it, it's... Uh, it, it's a strange set of things we're seeing and a lot of different trends. Um, and most of them that are top down aren't good. No, they try to make it sound like it's good and to, you know, gloss it over with you know, advancement, but it's always at the expense of humanity and empathy and individuality. And for me, those are the hallmarks of what it means to be human. So, and to have a some sort of passion about living. How do you live in a society where you're basically just a drone or hooked into it? I mean, it sounds like the matrix, basically. It kind of does. And, you know, there's a, this is more of a philosophical, perhaps even uh, uh, ecclesiastical question, but, you know, look, human beings come, uh, are the the biggest problem with human beings is that um, when you get so much power, you know they say money changes people. It doesn't. It reveals them. Well, I think you could say power doesn't change people. It reveals them. And the human heart is 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 capable of all kinds of things, depending on what you know what the situation is. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. you get pacifist people, and then they if they have to defend their kids. Vera comes out and, and, you know, look out because she will stop at nothing. And mm -hmm. that, so there's, you know, people, have, and some people are sadistic. Some people, you know, don't care about humanity. Joe Stalin said, right now, he said, well, one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. Um, so you have to harden your heart. I mean, perhaps it's already hardened. Maybe you're dehumanized in some way. But um, I, I think, you know, we looked at, when I was in college, Hitler was an aberration. We couldn't explain it from a international relations point of view. Okay, it, it was an aberration. He, he, he didn't fit the mold. Well, within the next thirty years of his death, there was there was Mao Zedong, and then there was Pol Pot, and then there was you know the kind of Kiva, and, and so there's a bunch of little Hitlers running around slaughtering people in mass. And so we have to ask, well. It certainly looks like Hitler isn't the aberration anymore. No. Um, isn't that a frightening thought? 
I'm optimistic because there, I think there are more awesome, excellent, empathetic people who outweigh this. They just want to oh, suppress the voice. That's why they're trying to suppress the internet and everything else, because people, I think on the whole, are really good. And this is a super imposition of this, this negative, evil system on people. We just need to wake up, find each other, withdraw our consent from this situation and get rid of it, throw it off. Sure. I mean, look, yeah, you think about Klaus Schwab and, and, and Albert Borla from Pfizer and say the Bill Gateses and, and these guys, you know, there's only a very thin layer. They just happen to be at the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They just happen to be in charge of policy. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, most people aren't going to be doing those types of things, the vast, vast, vast majority, but that type of person, whether it's, they have some kind of malfunctioning moral compass or, 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 or um, uh, attached to some other kind of, uh, influence, spiritual influence, perhaps. Uh, but if they're doing those types of things and they have power, that's why they're doing it. That, that's what allows them to do it. So we. Sure, there's a heck of a lot more good people, decent people than there are than there are indecent people. But um, I will say it, it seems to be there's a lot more indecency running around these days. I would more agree manifestations of it. I would agree with that. But I don't think I think there's an end point to it. We have to bring it to an end. And unfortunately, we're at the end of the show. So I want to make sure that people know how to um, read your articles and how they can uh, we can find your book if it's still out there. Sure. They can go, read my articles, the Epic times. Um, I have usually an, art, an article or two a week. Um, and you know, it fluctuates. So you can go to the banana Republican.com. And, uh, my book is available on Amazon. Um, let's see, I'm speaking next week or the week after Lincoln club in orange County. Um, I have some of those potential speaking days, but I, I don't know what they are at the moment. But um, so that's they, they can get a hold of me. I, I'm, I'm on um, I'm on Twitter and they can get a hold of me there. And um, yeah. happy to chat. Happy to hear your thoughts and and um, rally for the good cause. Always. Mr. Gory, thank you so much for joining me. I really enjoyed our conversation. You're just a blessing. Uh, my, th my many thanks to you, Dr. George. It's always a pleasure. I look forward to next time. Me too. Take care. Have a Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too. And thank you, everybody, for living in the solution. Revolutionary Talk for Revolutionary Times. Liberty Talk FM.